the sermon this morning is for him and for his good pleasure. I want you to look at the, the end of the chapter there in Revelation chapter number 4. And I want to focus in on verse number 8. The Bible says this, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And then it says this, And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Verse 9, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Michaela, grab me a water real quick. Verse number 11. That's not what they said. This is what they said. Verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I'll reiterate the title of the sermon one more time is For Him and For His Good Pleasure. Now, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of what the subject of the sermon is about. I'm basically going to give you the introduction of what it's about, and it's going to kind of open up from there. And it's the, the topic we're going to focus on here in just a moment is the purpose of life, if you will. Just here for a moment, we're going to, we're going to focus on the purpose of life. And you really see the entire purpose of life, the point of why you exist and why you even breathe today in verses 10 and 11. And that is to worship God. I want you to look in verse number 11 what it says. Again, he says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Now watch this. For because thou hast created all things. And look at this statement. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Everything was created by the one and only true God, which sits in heaven. The God of the Bible, Jehovah, God Almighty, Amen. Jesus Christ, everything was created by the one and only true God. And do you know why? The whole purpose why he created everything, the ultimate goal of everything, was for you to serve him and to worship him and to give glory and honor unto him. You have a scenario here where John goes down and he sees a vision. And there are these four beasts that God created. These are not four beasts that roam the earth. These are not four beasts that live on the earth. These are four beasts that God created. You know what for? Just to stand around his throne. You know what the purpose of life for these beasts were? Just to stand around God's throne. And I want you to look at verse number 8 again and say this. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. Here, this, so this is what they looked like. And they were full of eyes within. And then look at this. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then it says, which was and is and is to come. I want you to understand the purpose why God created these beasts. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God decided that I'm going to create four living creatures. And these four living creatures are just going to stand around my throne for all eternity. And they're not going to do anything else, but they're going to be around my throne. And they're just going to worship me. And they're going to serve me. And they're going to bring honor unto me. And they're going to bring glory to me. Has anyone ever really thought about that? That these four beasts, that their purpose just stands around the throne. And God created them just to serve him continually for all eternity. You know what? Your life is no different. Your life is no different at all. And you know what? There's no difference in any of the creation. Because look at, right after that, look at verse number 10. And four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. What? Look at this. And worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Do you know what the purpose for mankind is? The purpose for all of God's creation? To worship and to serve Him and to bring honor and glory unto Him. You want to know what the purpose of life is? You say, why was I even created? Why am I here in the first place? For Thou hast created all things. God created all things. And for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God created everything to serve and to worship and to bring honor and to bring glory unto him. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. 
Philippians chapter number 2, verse 13 says this, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Again, I don't know if you, you've actually thought about what this verse is saying, but listen to it closely. For it is God which worketh in you. So the Holy Spirit works in us, right? God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the Holy Spirit is working in you. He's working in you so that he can do his, his own work, that he can do what pleases him. Look, it's, uh, I'm going to read you from 2 Thessalonians. You stay in Colossians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians, again, chapter 1, verse 11 says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with you. You are created to fulfill God's will. You are created to bring God pleasure. That's the reason why you exist, is to bring God pleasure. And let me say this from the very beginning. The only person that that would bother would be a selfish person, would be a, a, a self-centered type of person, right? Now, we ourselves, we it is not right for us to be self-centered. It is not right for us to be concerned about the things of ourself because we are the creation, because we were created by God and we have a purpose given to us. You know, the Bible talks about like in Romans, I believe it's Romans chapter number nine. You know, what can the, what can, shall the same, the thing form say unto that, uh, he which formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? You have no right to say anything. Do you know why God receives glory and honor and praise? Because he deserves it. That's why. That's the reason why God, why God, he can say, you know, I created everything for his glory. He can do that. Because that's what he deserves. It's right for him to be given glory and honor and praise. Because he is the Lord of Lords, and he is the King of Kings, and he is the God of Gods. We are nothing compared to him. You know, mankind puffs himself up, uh, himself up sometimes and gets too big for his britches. But you don't deserve anything, pal. You don't deserve anything in life. Nothing. God didn't have to create you in the first place. You didn't even have to be a thought. You know, you're lucky that God even just made you to be able to serve and worship him. You know, I'm, so the right attitude would be just to be happy that we are, we are able to serve such a great you know, and wonderful and honorable God, a God that's worthy of honor. I want you to look again in Colossians chapter number 1. Like I said, <clears throat> Colossians chapter number 1, we're going to see a very similar statement. So we saw God seated on the throne before, and it said that, For thou, God, speaking of God, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I want you to look at Colossians chapter number 1 now. We'll begin reading in verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So, of course, speaking of Jesus Christ. In whom, that's the Son, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So it's speaking of the Son, saying the Son created all things, correct? Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now watch this. All things were created by him. And look at those next three words. And for him. Everything that exists was created from God, right? And you know the reason why it was created? For him. He didn't make you just to go do your own thing. He didn't make creation just to, do its, to fulfill its own will. God created everything. And specifically, he that was seated on the throne... By comparing simple scripture with scripture, we see that it was Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ created all things, everything. And you know why he created it? For himself. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. He is the God of gods. He is worthy of power and honor and glory. He's Amen. worthy of creating. You know, He deserves four beasts to be standing around his throne. You know, the very least that we could do is cast the crown that he gave to us in the first place at his feet. Right. You don't deserve anything in the first place, so you need to have a selfless attitude. You need to understand that he's worthy of honor and glory and praise. That's why, you know, we honor and glorify him. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 43, verse number 21. Isaiah chapter number 43, verse number 21. There's a, you know, I've heard, this, is, this isn't anything new, this, this type of attack where, where people will attack God and try to say that God you know, is, is selfish. 
that God is sadistic or God is just self-centered and things like that. I've heard that and usually it comes from atheists. Usually it comes from people that, that don't like God, that just hate God. And people will make these types of claims and attack, attacks to God, you know, where he's just, I don't want to serve a God, atheists will say. It's just, you know, he just created me just to worship him, you're saying. I mean, everyone's heard people say that before, right? I've heard that numerous times out soul winning. I've, I've heard it in numerous different, uh, you know, uh, channels or sources, right? I've seen things on, uh, on YouTube of just atheist uh, evolutionists, if you will, debating creationists. And they'll make statements along those lines, right? But you know what? Christians sometimes can fall into this stupidity. Christians sometimes can, can accuse God of, like we've heard recently, glorifying himself, right? They can accuse God of, you know, lifting himself up. But we're going to look here for a while. I'm going to beat a dead horse this morning. Amen. Now, you know, there are so many verses in the Bible. Listen carefully. There are so many verses in the Bible where God glorifies himself, right. where God exalts himself, where God lifts himself up. And you know what? I had to eliminate a lot of verses from my sermon because I don't want to be here for two hours, right? God repeatedly, all throughout the Bible, glorifies himself. And I want you to understand this even. God created everything for what? To glorify him. So even in the sense of creation... God is glorifying himself. Nothing existed, and you know what he said? I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, he was the cause and effect, right? I'm going to make something to glorify me. So what's he really doing there? If you, if you cut out the mediator, he's glorifying himself, isn't he? He's, he's creating something to glorify him. But you know what? He had to create it first, right? What was the, what was the reason why? So that he could receive glory. That was the whole reason why. God, he's God. You know, if he wants to glorify himself, then you need to just shut your mouth. Amen. You need to. And here's the thing. If you don't believe in a, in a God that glorifies himself, then you don't believe in the God of the Bible. And this right. is going to become abundantly clear here in just a few minutes. So I want you to look here in Isaiah chapter number 43. I want you to look at verse number 21. Actually, let's read before that. Let's read verse number 18. So this is God speaking. Remember ye not the former things, neither the things of old, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a good thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now watch this. The beast of the field shall honor me. That sound familiar? Saying he's talking about creation is going to honor him. Creation is going to worship him. He says the dragons and the owls because I give waters in the wilderness. You notice that? He's the one that put it there in the first place. Because I give waters waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. Now, I want you to watch this. This people, this is speaking of the nation of Israel. This people have I formed for myself. You notice that? You know the reason why God created the nation of Israel in the first place? For himself. Do you know the reason why God created the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? When he brought them out of Egypt, when he chose Abraham, not for Abraham and not for those people out there, you know, that he, that he brought through the wilderness for himself. That was the ultimate goal of, of, of the, you know, what was, once, what was at one time established of the nation of Israel, the true nation of Israel of the Old Testament. He says, this people have I formed for myself. Now watch this. They shall show forth my praise. Do you know why he formed them for himself? To glory him. To praise him. The same reason in which he created the world in the first place. The, so, the whole reason why he created the nation of Israel was so that he could receive honor and glory from a peculiar people. A people that he would set apart and their whole purpose would be to worship and serve him. He says that he sanctifies them and he says that he makes them a nation of priests, right? Just like it says that we're a nation of priests. But you know, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, nation of Israel, there were specific priests who actually did a duty, right? And you know what he said he did for them? That their job was that he was just going to set them apart. So the same way in which he set the nation apart to worship and serve him, even within that nation, he set apart the Levites. And do you know what their job was? To continually just attend to the altar. You know what they're doing? They're just worshiping and praising him. They're just glorifying him continually. I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter number 45. A lot of what we're going to read is going to be in the book of Isaiah, actually in uh, the 40s, the chapter, the, the, these few chapters here, 40 through 48, if you will. Psalm chapter number 50, verse 15 says this, And call upon me in the day of trouble. 
I will deliver thee. And then he says this, and thou shalt glorify me. Thou shalt glorify me. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter number 45, verse number 4. The Bible says this, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Verse 6. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. Excuse me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Stay in Isaiah 45. I want you to look at verse 18. Verse 18, it says this. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I the Lord speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Are you noticing a pattern here while God is speaking? Does anyone notice this pattern while we're reading? Do you know a word that just keeps popping up? A one-letter word? I, 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 I. Do you know, you know, uh, as human beings, when people begin, uh, you know, sentences oftentimes with I, do you know uh, what you can learn a lot of times about their psyche, about what type of person they are? That they are centered on themselves. Do you know what? God is a centered, a God-centered being. And that's a fact. That's true. And there's nothing wrong with that. And people just need to get a grip with that. Everything was created for him in the first place. Right. He, everything exists because of him. You know, you wouldn't even have breath to curse him if he hadn't made you in the first place. If he hadn't brought this world into existence. And we need to just be thankful that he allows us to receive goodness and pleasure and blessings in this life. And that he didn't just create us just to be, you know, these unhappy slaves and servants, but that he allowed us to take part, you know, in the glory of heaven and all of the good things that he gave to us. And we need to understand this above all things, that why shouldn't you honor? Because God gives you free will. He doesn't force you to worship him. But why should you? Because he deserves it. That's really the real reason why. Because he is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, and you don't even deserve to be here. You know, what could you have, who, you know, who could have given him something? You know, who would have given God something, like it says in the book of Romans, that he made, that God would have to recompense them? Nothing. You know, you couldn't have even have no, negotiated, or no one. You couldn't even have negotiated with God, like, please create me, right? He had to make you first. Do you understand what I'm saying? You wouldn't even have the breath to curse it. God can be God-centered. And that's what type of God that he is. It's because he deserves it. Right. And so over and over and over again in the book of Isaiah, you know what he says repeatedly? I, I, I. You know what? Rightfully so. Right. You know what he's doing? He's glorifying himself. Right. When, he's, when he's sitting there talking to you and he's telling you, you know, I made this and I created that. I make peace and I create evil. What's he saying? He says there's no God else beside me. There's no one else. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, do you know how great I am? Do you know how powerful I am? Do you know what he's really doing? He's praising himself. He's honoring and he's praising and he's glorifying himself. If I were to do that, it would be boasting. It would be wrong. Why? Because, because I'm nothing. That's why. Because I'm just his creation and there's someone above me who can look down upon me and say, shut your mouth. Do you know what? There's no one above God that can say that. Right. Right. That's why he can do that and you can't. That's why it's wrong for you to do it, and it's fine for him to do it. It's right for him to do it, because even if, even if, you know, like when Jesus was coming in, uh, you know, to Jerusalem, and he and, and someone says, you know, uh, you know, you need to tell these people to stop praising you. He says, if they weren't praising me, these rocks would scream out and praise Amen. me. All of creation was made to praise and glorify Jesus Christ. All of it. And you know what? He can sit there and he can brag about how great he is because it's true. Right. Because he is that great and he is that powerful. Amen. And you know what? Nobody else is on his level. That's why he can say, I create peace and I make evil. You know why? Because you don't and nobody else does. There's none else beside him that can do that. 
That's why. Look over at Isaiah chapter number 45 again. We'll pick back up in... Uh, where did we stop reading? Does anyone remember? Was it verse 18? Yeah, look at verse 18 again. <clears throat> For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth, and they, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. The Lord, I the Lord speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. I want to keep reading down through this for a moment. I want you to keep that in mind. And repeatedly just saying, I, look at verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the, the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together who have declared this from ancient time, who have told it from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Look at this. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. Do you notice what the emphasis is on while he's speaking? Me. He says, I have sworn by myself. I didn't need someone else to swear for me. I didn't need someone else to, to witness you know, the promise that I made. I swore by myself. He says, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, that it shall not return unto me, and it, it shall not return that unto me... <clears throat> Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. I don't know if you've thought about this, but he's saying that I've made a promise. I have made a vow that there will be a day in which every knee will bow to me. Amen. That's what he's saying. Have you ever thought about that? He's saying that I made a vow and it's going to happen because I said it. Right. There's a vow that I've made and I swore it by myself that I promise you that there will be a day in which every single knee that has ever walked on this earth will bow. Every single knee is going to make sure that they stand Amen. before him. And you bow and you're, you are going to call me Lord one day. That's right. He is going to force all of creation, whether they want to or not. Amen. Think about that. He's forcing them. So you say, oh, well, you know, he's not glorifying himself by creation because you have free will. Oh, really? You know what's going to happen one day? He's going to make them whether they want to or not. Even if some, you know, let's just say in an imaginary world, because I don't believe this to be true. Some hardened atheist is still able to stand before God and be proud. It's not going to happen. But let's just say that it was. God already swore it. You're going to bow to me. So he would force that man, whether it's whoever, Richard Dawkins, he wants to stand before God and mock. He's just going to be, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know what's going on. He's going to bow right before him. And you know what? God's going to cause the Holy Spirit to speak through him. And you know what he's going to say? The same God that he cursed his whole life. He's going to say, you know what? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Whether he wanted to say that or not. You know what that is? That's God glorifying himself. Amen. That's God making that person. Not just giving him free will even, but making him glorify him. God made the earth and everything in it to bring honor and pleasure and glory to him. God created the nation of Israel for him. That's the whole reason why. Jesus Christ spoke this world into existence and everything that he made was for his plan. And do you know what the ultimate goal is? The main reason of the whole universe is to glorify God. Amen. And you know what? God can glorify himself if he wants to, and God does glorify himself repeatedly. Look at verse number 24. Surely shall one say, and the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against them shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and glory. <clears throat> I want you to turn over to Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 25. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 25. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy. I want you to keep that in mind about how God just continually just says, I and I. Talks about how great he is. What he's doing. You know what he's doing? He's boasting. And you know what? I enjoy reading that stuff. Like what I'm getting ready to read to you right now, I love this passage. When God is just standing there just talking about how great he is. You know what he's doing? He's boasting. He's glorying. That's what he's doing. Listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I am he. 
and there is no God with me. There's no God with me. And then he says this, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword, wet means to sharpen. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Do you hear the power in God's words when he speaks? No one speaks like this man. Just like they said about Jesus Christ. No one. And he starts off in the beginning. You know what he wants to make sure that you understand? You know, Orthodox Trinitarian, there's nobody with me. The, one, the words that are coming out of this person's mouth, he's saying there's no one with me. There's no one beside me. And further proof of that is he even makes the statement, if I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever, hand, singular, one hand. If I lift up my hand forever and say, I live forever. You say, oh, he has to have three witnesses. If I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. What's he doing? He's testifying. Right. One person, one God, one singular image says, I lift up my hand. I testify. The word has gone out of my mouth. I've sworn. He doesn't need another witness as far as another person. Right. You know what witnesses? His own words. His, the own, his own words that come out of his mouth and his spirit. That's what bears record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Notice this also. He said that the, the, the difference between all of the gods of the Old Testament, when, they, when the nation of Israel worshipped God, you know what the difference between the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament, and then all of the heathen nations is that they, they believed in a multiplicity of gods. They believed in more than one God. And this is what God says. One more time, verse 30, in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, verse 39, says this, See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. He's saying, I'm not like those other nations. I'm not like the, the gods of those other nations. He says, there's no God with me. He said, and then he says this, I kill and I make alive. I wound and heal. Do you know why in, the, uh, in, in many other cultures that are polytheists, polytheistic, do you know what they believe? One God may do something and then another God does something else. One God may wound, but then there's another God that heals. Do you understand what I'm saying? One God may do one thing, and then there's a, there's a God of the water, but then there's also a God of the fire. There's a God of love, and there's a God of, you know, whatever, maybe war, right? And Greek mythology and all of these things. But you know what God's saying? I wound and I heal. I kill and I make alive. And he says, there's no God with me. It's only me. Amen. And you know what? I don't have this other person or this other God next to me to testify on my behalf. He says, you know what I do? I just lift up my hand to heaven. I swear by myself. He says in Isaiah 45, the word has gone out of my mouth, singular, one God, testifying on his own behalf. And, half. and what's testifying? Him and his word and his spirit Amen. and his Holy Spirit. That's what's testifying. Amen. Where did I have you turn? Isaiah 40. I want you to look in Isaiah chapter number 40. Look at verse number 25. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal saith the Holy One. Let those words sink down deep into your ears. The Holy One, saith the Holy One. So one person speaks and says, to whom will you liken me? And sh or, or shall I be equal? And then I guess you got these other persons like, hey, you forgot about me. <laughs> you got this other guy over here like, hey, I'm your equal. We're, we're, you know, we're co-equal. This other person over here. <laughs> You, you know, that's what the Orthodox Trinitarians say, you know, the co-equal persons, right? It's ridiculous. Amen. And then he even say, he ends it by saying the Holy One. Do you notice that? Amen. Saith the Holy One. The Holy One says, who will you liken me? Or who shall be my equal? Who's like me? You know what the answer is? No one. And you know what God's doing when he says this? He's boasting. He's saying, I'm greater than everyone. There's no one on my level. That's what he's saying. There's no one like me. Look at me and you see how great I am. No one's like me. That's the God of the Bible. 
Amen. That is the God of the Bible, and that shouldn't make you uncomfortable. I like that. Amen. You know what I like saying? That's my God. That's the God that I worship. The God that I worship is greater than everyone, and there's no one that's his equal. You know, the gods of the other nations, you know, they're nothing compared to God. Even what they can dream up in their own imagination, they still don't compare under the God of the Bible. So he says, to whom then would ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? You know what he's doing? He's saying, look around at the creation. Who created these things? You know what the answer is? The guy talking. He's saying, you know how great I am? You know how powerful I am? That's what he's saying. Look at what he says after that. <clears throat> created these things that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name by the greatness of his might. You know what he just said? This is God talking. So he calls them all by names, and he says this, by the greatness of his might. He's speaking in third person about himself. God says, by the greatness of his might, talking about himself. You know what he's doing? He's glorifying himself Amen. right now. Amen. He's, he's, he's praising himself. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> For that he is strong in power, talking about himself, not one faileth. Look at verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over my God? Look at verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, this is the everlasting God speaking, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. And look what he says next. next. There is no searching of his understanding. Now this is directly God speaking. Right? And there are examples in the Bible of where God just records man's words, even outside of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But do you know all the glory and praise that Paul gives to God? That's through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his writings. You ever think about that? All the glory and praise when Peter stands up and he, he talks about how great God is, that's through the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought of that? That's the Holy Spirit speaking those words. And you know what? They're true. Obviously, God uses man. Of course, we can see man's personality being used as well. Do you know what? That's the Holy Spirit speaking those words. Right. Do you know what you have here? You have God saying about himself, by the greatness of his might. Talking about himself. Saying, nothing that I do will fail. Nothing that I do will fail. You know, do you know how great my strength is? You know what he's doing? He's glorifying himself. Like I said, I'm going to beat a dead horse this morning. I don't know if you've ever noticed these verses, but I'm going to look at quite, quite a few of these Go to Isaiah chapter number 33. Isaiah chapter number 33. The God of the Bible exalts himself. Amen. He exalts himself. Look at Isaiah chapter number 33, verse number 10. Notice these words. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Watch what he says. Now will I be exalted. You say, oh, well, it's somebody else exalting him. Look at the next statement. Now will I lift up myself. Do you know who exalts God? God. That's right. Do you know, you know why? Because no one else can. Right. Do you know why someone doesn't testify on God's behalf? Because your witness is not good enough. We need, you know, God's witness. Do you know why God doesn't have somebody else to swear? He swears and he confirms it. Do you know why he doesn't have somebody else witness him? Because he is the only one that's worthy. Do you, no one could exalt God. So do you know what? When God's exalted, he exalts himself. In a true legitimate form, I'm saying. But we can praise and glorify him, right? But, you know, what's greater than the glory coming from the greatest? The one that only speaks truth, right? And when he glorifies himself, you know, wow, that's true. Even when he brags and he boasts and he glorifies himself. That's true. And you know what he says right there? Read it one more time. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Will I lift up myself. You know what he's saying? He's saying, now I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to glorify myself. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 38. Ezekiel chapter number 38. Ezekiel chapter number 38. <clears throat> Look at verse number 23, Ezekiel 38, verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You know how many times God says that throughout the Bible? And he says, I'm going to do this. 
so that they know that I am the Lord. He's saying that I am the creator of the ends of the earth, that I am all-powerful and almighty. God, all throughout the Bible, does things just so that you know who he is, so that you can know and you can think in your mind, man, he is great. He is powerful. He is mighty. This, this, this must be the true God. And he says there in the very beginning, thus will I magnify myself. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to glorify myself. I'm going to lift myself up. It's the same way of saying, I'm going to exalt myself. He's saying, I'm going to glorify myself. And then he says this, I'm going to sanctify myself. I'm going to set myself apart, is what he's saying. I'm going to make it so that you know that I'm not like you. I'm going to make it so that you know that I'm different, that I'm greater than you, and I'm more powerful than you. That's, what's God, that's what God is saying. Go to back to Isaiah chapter number 43 one more time. Isaiah chapter number 43. Isaiah chapter number 43. I don't believe we read this. We were in Isaiah 43 just a moment ago. You know what? I think we did read verses 5. Did we read verse 5 earlier? Verse 5 says this, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up. And to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him, look at this, for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. No, we didn't read that a moment ago, but notice what he said. He said, he said I created him for my glory. Do you know why everything is created? You've heard me say it six times now, but listen one more time for his glory. Amen. To praise him, to worship him, and to serve him. Everything exists so that God will receive glory. The nation of Israel, God set them apart to glorify himself. He says this, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. I want you to turn to, go over to Isaiah chapter 44 now. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 44. No, and this phrase right here is very important. Uh, but there's a specific word that's used here. No, I want you to notice what he says. Isaiah chapter number 44, verse 23. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Why should we sing? Because God did it. For the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains. O forest and every, every tree therein. What is he saying? Everything needs to praise and worship and glorify me. Now look at the very next statement. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and then he says this, and glorified himself in Israel. Glorified himself in Israel. You just worship a God that just glorifies himself. Yeah, I worship the God of the Bible, buddy. That's who I worship. Maybe you need to read your Bible a little more often. Maybe that's what you need to do. You know, all of these people, when they get into heresy, they, it's like they, they become, they're so desperate to just cover up their lies and to cover up their false doctrine that it's like, you know, they become illiterate when it comes to the Bible. Just plain statements. You know what you should have done before you start saying, oh, you just worship a God that glorifies himself. Just get out your Bible app and type in glorify myself, glorify himself, and see if it's God speaking ever. Because you know what? He says, I created you to glorify me. I made you to worship and to praise and to serve me. Everything was created for me. And you know what for? My pleasure. You know why I made Israel? You know why I formed that nation? To serve and worship me. I have four beasts standing around my throne that are going to continually honor and glorify and serve me. And you know what? The people that I redeem, there are 24 elders that are going to sit before before my throne. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them a crown. And you know what they're going to do with that crown? They're going to cast it before my feet for all eternity and worship and serve me. Amen. And you know what I did when I redeemed Israel? I glorified myself. I worshiped, you know, I, I, I created them to worship me so that I would receive glory through them. That's what God, that's the God of the Bible. Right? Amen. Amen. Do you know what? He can say, I create peace and I make evil. He can say, I am and I am he, and beside me there is no God. He can sit there and brag and boast. And do you know what you should do? You should just shut your mouth. No, actually, you shouldn't shut your mouth. You should actually glorify and worship him with God. Amen. God sits there and brags, you know what I'm going to say? Amen. Amen. God wants to talk about how great he is, the greatness of his strength. You know what I'm going to say? Amen. You are great. You deserve the honor. You deserve the praise. You deserve the glory. You know what? If 
he wants to glorify himself, shall the same the thing form say unto him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? No, it shouldn't. It should just join in and praise him. You know, those four beasts have no other purpose. Do you realize that? He made these four beasts. It says continually just over and over and over again. Just that I want you to stand before my throne. And I want you to just talk about how great I am. That's, that's, what, it, that's what he did. Everybody realizes that, right? I want you to stand before my throne. And I want you to just, you know what? Just give me the honor that's due unto me. You know what the honors do? For all eternity, you should stand before God and cast your crown before his feet. Amen. And you should just honor and glorify him. Do you know, you know what the God of the Bible does? He glorifies himself. Right, right. I want you to look at what it's actually talking about right here, too. Because it says this, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob. So, obviously, you could look at this from a physical standpoint. Right? He redeemed them maybe from Egypt. But you know what? God actually you know, died for the sins of his people. Those that he would die for, he died for the church. Those that, you know, he obviously died for everyone, but the Bible puts an emphasis on that he redeemed the saved. Right? Especially them that are you know, the saved. Right? <clears throat> so when it says he redeemed Jacob here, you could also interpret this that it's talking about salvation. And who redeemed Jacob? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who redeemed Israel? Who, you know, who is the one that paid for the sins of his people? For he shall save his people from his sins. Jesus. Amen. And you know what Jesus did? He created everything for himself. He created everything. He created for himself. You know what he did? He glorified himself. Amen. He glorified himself in Israel. That's what he did. The God of the Bible glorifies himself. I want you to turn to... Mm, have you go to another passage here? Go to go to go to the old go to the New Testament since we're talking about this now. Go to John chapter number eight, verse number fifty-four. John chapter number eight, verse number fifty-four. I'm going to explain a couple of things, verses that people will bring up, you know, uh, and have tried to attack our church or attack the statements and the things that we believe about the Godhead. I want to address a couple of these and explain these to these ignoramuses that just don't understand their Bible, and that's really what's going on here. Isaiah 42, verse 5, listen to this. Thus saith God, God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, I, will, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. I want you to notice what the Lord said. The God of the Old Testament that boasts, that glories in himself, that glorifies himself, he says, my glory, I'm not going to give to another. The glory that I have, I will not share for another. But I don't know if you've ever noticed the passage in which this statement is found. It's one other verse, and I'm going to read that in a moment. But specifically the passage when people quote this where it's found in Isaiah, it's actually speaking about how Jesus is going to go and do, when the man Christ Jesus is going to be born and he's going to go and preach the gospel. And it says this, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee, and he says this, and give thee for a covenant of the people for a life of the Gentiles. You know who that is? That's actually quoted about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And then he says, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So God speaks and prophesies about how the man Christ Jesus would come one day, the Christ, the Messiah, and how he would be a light unto the Gentiles, how he would bring salvation, if you will to all of the world. And then after that, he says, I'm the Lord. And he says, in my glory, will I not give to another? I want you to look over there. You're in John chapter number 8. Correct? John chapter number 8. Let's look at John chapter number 8 verse number 54. So this is a passage that people will bring up sometimes. John chapter number 8 verse number 54. Jesus says this. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. And then he says this. 
It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to point out about this. Number one, the Bible talks about when Jesus was born as a man, that he humbled himself. That's the one true God choosing to humble himself, right? When God walked this earth, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ came down this earth, he had a particular mission. And he wanted to fulfill the commandments of God. He had to fulfill all righteousness. You know what he did? He prayed to God. He was a real man. The Bible talks about how he grew in wisdom and he grew in knowledge. And do you know what else it says? It says he grew. Because I've quoted that other part many times. But listen to the next part. It says he grew in, in a stature, it says. And then it says this. He grew in favor with man and God. Do you notice that? Do you know what it contrasts? It's not talking about, oh, that's just the first person. No, he grew in favor with man and God. You know, so the man Christ Jesus was legitimately a man. And throughout his life, he pleased his father. He always did that which pleased his father. He was a real man. He assumed a mind. He lived upon this earth, and he took upon him limitations. But he was all at that same time fully God. You know what he did? He walked perfectly in God's commandments. He set an example for us, and he kept the righteousness of God. You know who the only person that could have done that? God himself. That's right. So he came down and he humbled himself willingly. And as a man, he did not honor himself. He humbled himself. But do you know who did honor him? The guy that said, my, my glory will I not give to another. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know what honor is? It's glory. But then you have God in heaven glorifying him. We didn't, we didn't look at this, but that same God that was seated upon the throne in Revelation 4, that they cast their crowns before and they honor, they give, the, it says the words, they give honor and glory unto him. Actually, let's look at it because it's very important. The more I think about how important it is, go over to Revelation 4. Go to Revelation chapter number 4. I want you to keep that verse that I just read to you a moment ago. I want you to keep that in mind. Where God says that he, that he will not give his glory to another. Go to Revelation 4 where we were. Before Revelation chapter number four. So at the end there, it, you know, we see it says in verse number, verse number eight again. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come." And when those beasts give glory and honor, so you know what honor is? It's glory. They're the same thing. They're giving glory and they're giving honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Do you know what glory is? Do you know what honor is? They're the same thing. And power. I want you to look over it. Revelation chapter number 5, we all know here that, that, that the Lamb comes and takes. He's worthy, right, to take the book out of the hand of him that sits on the throne. I want you to look at what happens right here. Let's look at verse number uh, 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. This is, of course, Jesus Christ taking it from God the Father. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps. And golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. So it's not just the beast now. Look at this. Many angels round about the throne. And the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands, sang with a loud voice. So every angel that is in heaven and every beast sang with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb! That was slain to receive power and riches and to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength. Now look at this. And honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven. Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. And all that are in them heard I say. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. Now watch this. And 
unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, ever. Isaiah 48 verse 9 says this, For my name's sake. What is my? Singular or plural? Singular. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger. And for my praise will I refrain for thee. Notice my praise for my glory. That I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction for mine own sake. I want you to notice this language. Even for mine own sake. He repeats himself. Do you notice the stress on the singularity repeatedly? So even from an Orthodox Trinitarian's view, who's speaking? It's got to be one person, and I'm sure they'd say the Father, right? It's not definitely not going to be the Son of the Holy Spirit. So he says repeatedly, for mine own sake... And then he says, even for mine own sake will I do it, for how should my name be polluted? And then he says this, and I will not give my glory unto another. But do you know what you have going on? You have people giving glory unto him that sits on the throne. And everybody would say, of course, that's the Lord of the Old Testament, of course. But then somebody else comes up. Somebody else comes up, right? And you know what they do? They give glory and they give honor, and they give power. And they give the same glory and honor and power that they gave to that guy that was sitting on the throne. You know why? Because it's the same guy. Amen. That guy that's sitting on the throne said in the Old Testament, I'm not giving my glory unto another. So you know the only option you have? The guy that said I'm not giving my glory unto the other is a pushover, number one. That, that's, that, let's say this. I'm going to give you two options. He's either a pushover, because then he's like, I should say something right now. But, uh, go ahead. I guess he can have glory. I guess he is my equal. Right? He's either a pushover and he doesn't say anything, or it is him that sent him on the throne. That's right. right. Or it's the same guy. Amen. It's Amen. the same guy that said in the Old Testament, for my own name's sake, for my sake, I'm going to do this. And my glory, I'm not going to give to another. So when you have in John chapter number 8, verse number 54, I believe it was, where you have Jesus saying, I don't honor myself. You know what you have? You have a legitimate, bona fide man saying that I chose to humble myself. I'm the God of this universe, the Son of Man which is in heaven. And I chose to come down to this earth. And you know what? I'm going to live like a man while I'm here. And I'm going to worship and serve the one true God as a man, right? He's, he is, of course, fully God. But in his, in his humanity, while he was a man walking on this earth, he chose not to honor himself. Didn't he? He could have called multiple legions of angels, but he didn't. Right? right? He could have done that, but he always said, there's another that honors me. There's another, that, there's another that gives me glory, is what he's saying. But then the God of the Old Testament says, my glory I'm not going to give to another. Same thing as honor. He's saying, my honor I'm not going to give to another. But then Jesus says, there's another that honors me. There's another one that glorifies me. You have no other choice. Here's the thing, if that, if that bothers you and makes you uncomfortable that Jesus Christ was the God in heaven and he was glorifying himself, then you have a problem with the only real interpretation of the Bible. Right, right. It's the only interpretation. Even from your perspective, you have a, a singular person speaking saying, I'm not going to give my glory unto another. I'm not going to give my glory unto, unto another. So you either have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Old Testament saying, I'm not sharing my glory, and then giving their glory, glory later on, contradicting themselves, or it's the same one God. Even from this, this bizarre, you know, Orthodox Trinitarian view, you still have God, the one God, God glorifying the one God. Even if they say, and it's, and it's not in, a, in even a real sense, it's almost abstract when you have to say just the one God glorifying the one God. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not, it doesn't even make sense. But you have, they say, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's one God, right? It's one essence that they all three share amongst each other. They make up one God. Right? It's like Voltron. <laughs> right? And they make up one God. Okay? You have this one God. So, so basically, the one God is in heaven, right? The Father, the one God. Okay. Well, the one God is on earth, right? He's still the one God, right? And you have the one God that's on earth glorifying the one God that's in heaven. 
we still have a problem. This didn't fix anything. Does everyone understand? God is still glorifying God. And do, do, do you, I can solve this problem for you. There's more than one God. If, that, if, if that's what people believe, right? That's your only other option, really. You can't just say, well, no, 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 it's one person that's glorifying the other person. No. Let's, let's back up again. Do you believe that the one God is in heaven? Yes, he's God the Father. Okay. Do you believe that the one God is also on earth? Yes, it's God the Son. Okay, so, so God on earth is glorifying God in heaven, right? If you don't believe that it's the same God, the same person, then you believe that there is a multiplicity of gods. Right. You believe that God of the Old Testament spoke and said, my glory will I not give to another. Well, they, they, I guess they would try to say, oh, that's just essence speaking. So there's an essence outside of the three persons that just speaks. You understand what I'm saying? They believe, they want to try to make it like, oh, there's three persons. You can see them, one person, two persons, three persons. Where's the, where's the sound coming from? Where's this, where are these words coming from? Right. Let's, let's visualize and picture this, right? Let's, let's, let's try to understand what they're saying. Where's it coming from? Just an essence. Well, just an it's like It's like new agey stuff. Is it right. coming from the earth? Right. Where's it coming from? Right. Where is it coming from? Oh, it just comes from both of them. So all three people are saying, my glory will I not give to another. And who will you liken me? And whom shall you compare me? And they're just like, just get out of here. You're taking my glory, right? You're taking my honor. Do you see how ridiculous this is? Do you see how you, even from their own perspective, they can't even make sense out of this? Do you know your only option? Your only real option. If you're honest and you believe the Bible, the lamb is the guy sitting on the throne. And you know what? He's fine when the lamb comes. And this is a vision, of course, when the lamb comes and receives the glory. Because that's him that redeemed all of mankind unto him. He brought salvation unto himself. That's right. He reconciled the world. He was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. Amen. That makes perfect sense. I want you to go over to John chapter number 17 after we said that. John chapter number 17. John chapter number 17. It's already been explained, but I want to look, look at a couple of things here. John chapter number 17. I want you to look at verse number 1. I just want to read these verses. I don't necessarily have anything in my notes on this, but I want to look at this real quick. Verse 1. These words spake Jesus. So this is God on earth as a man, the one true God. But we don't believe in a multiplicity of persons even. We believe that the same person that's in heaven, the same one God, the, the same God, the same Jehovah, the same Lord of the Old Testament, that same God was on earth at the same time. And great is the mystery of godliness. And he was living on this earth as a legitimate, bona fide, real man. Fully God, but fully, understand those words, fully man. And that, right there, verse 17, verse 1, is, or chapter 17, verse 1, that is the man Christ Jesus speaking. And he says this, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, look at this, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So God said, I'm not going to glory, I'm my glory, I'm not going to share with another. Do you know what the only option you have here? I'm, this is gonna actually going to open this up, I believe, for you. Do you know the only option you have here? When you have, you know, uh, God in heaven glorifying the Son, do you know what option you have? That it's, you know, it's the one Lord. You know, God truly was manifest in the flesh. It's that simple. Right. It is Jehovah of the Old Testament as a man living. And you know what he's doing? He's glorifying himself as a man. Now, there is a real distinction. There's a strong distinction, of course, between the two when he took on the humanity. Because he assumed a, a human mind, right? So he's on this earth. He's still fully God and fully man. But you know what? You have the one God in heaven glorifying himself, just like he did in the Old Testament. When he says, I glorified myself in Israel. That's what he said. I glorified myself in Israel. Now you know what you have him, him doing here? You have him glorifying himself. In himself. Look at what it says in verse 1 again. The hour has come, glorify thy son. Now watch this. That thy son also may glorify thee. So you know what that's saying? It's saying glorify your son. That thy son also may glorify thee. Because he is him. So when he glorifies the son, he's automatically glorifying himself because he is the son. 
Does everyone understand what I'm saying? He's glorifying himself because he is the son. Look at verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So we have, remember, the God that said, I will not share my glory unto another, right? And you have a statement here where he says, glorify thou me with thine own self. You know why the emphasis is on thine own self? Because if you understand that God won't give his glory unto, unto another, then you understand that he is the own self there. Glorify thou me with thine own self. And then he says this, with the glory which I had with thee. Why? Did they share glory as in two persons? No. Do you know how he had this glory with him? In two ways. Number one, he had it through the word of God, because this moment would come one day. Through the promise that was given, the word that was spoken, right? Because the promise was made before the foundation of the world. But not only that, he had it with him because he was it. Right. That's how he had it with him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Now pay close attention to this. And the word was God. Amen. That's why they had this glory in that sense, because they are one. And then and with the with there is the word of God. I want you to go over to John chapter number 13. And I want you to keep that thought in mind. How God automatically, when, he, when God in heaven glorifies his son, how that automatically brings glory unto himself because that is him. It is the one and only true God. Look at John chapter number 13. This actually explains this concept. John 13, look at verse number 31. <clears throat> I thought it was verse 31. I must... Does anybody know what verse I'm looking for here? I, I knew it was John chapter number 13. Uh, verse number 28. That's not right either. Shoot. Does anybody know where this verse is by chance? The uh, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Or, or no, that God will glorify him, and he will glorify, he will straightway glorify him 32. in himself. Verse 32. Okay, it was just one, one verse off. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter, so it is. No, 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 it was right, 31 and 32. Sorry, John, I, was, I was looking at John 12. Look at John 13, look at verse 31. John 13, chapter 13, look at verse 31. It says this, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Now notice how he speaks about himself. Son, right? Of what? Of man. He's stressing his humanity, right? The Son of Man glorified. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and watch this, and God is glorified in him. So notice, when the Son of Man is glorified, God is just, at, is just automatically gl glorified in him. Do you know why? Because, because God was in Christ. Because the Son of Man is God. Look at what it says. And now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Verse 32, if God be glorified in him, so let, pay attention. This is kind of confusing. I want everyone to understand this. If God is glorified in the Son of Man, right? In the Son of Man, he's receiving glory through the Son of Man, if you will, or in the Son of Man. If God be glorified in him, God shall also, so as a result of that it's saying, God shall also glorify him, talking about the Son of Man, in himself. So if God receives glory through the Son of Man, he is also at the same time glorifying the Son of Man in God, in himself. Does everyone understand what it's saying? Look at the next statement. In himself, and then it says this, and shall straightway glorify him, referring to God. Do you know why? Because the Son of Man is the one and only true God. Amen. There's no way around it. He will not share his glory with another. So you know what you have? You have the Son of Man living upon this earth, and it is the one true God in heaven. You have the Lamb that comes to the throne, and he receives glory and honor and praise. And the God of the Old Testament says, I'm not giving my glory to another. Do you know what? That is the God of the Old Testament right. as a man. That's right. The Son of Man, that's the God of the Old Testament as a man receiving glory. Amen. That's the only option you have, buddy. Really? That's the only option that you have. And it's, and it's not even hard to understand. Right. It's the only option. It's not like I, I need to like kind of, you know... You know, pick through and call through some things so I can find out what this actually means. No, he won't give his glory to another. So the same person, singular, that said, I, 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 in the Old Testament, he said, I will not give my glory unto another, that is who was living on this earth as a man. 
God was manifest in the flesh. And then we have a multitude of verses to even explain that further when he says the Son of Man which is in heaven. The Son of Man which is in heaven. Every time when God or when uh, Jesus speaks of someone in heaven, who is it talking about? The Father. Every time. But then one time he says, the Son of Man which is in heaven. Because the God that's in heaven is glorifying him in himself. Do you understand? He's glorifying himself. Just like he glorified himself all throughout the whole Bible. Just like he created the world to glorify himself. Just like he said, I'm going to exalt myself. And you know what he did as the man Christ Jesus? He exalted himself in a real sense. He lifted himself up on the cross. And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Sounds like a lot of the focus is going toward Jesus. You know, maybe the first person's getting mad. No, it's because he, he, there's one person. There's one God. And you know what? He receives all the glory and all the honor through the man Christ Jesus. Through the Son of Man. He automatically glorifies himself in him because that is him. And he says, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter number 150. And this is a perfect place to end. Psalm chapter number 150. Psalm chapter 150. It's actually the very last psalm of the Bible. Psalm chapter 150, and this is really the, uh, the theme of the entire book of Psalms. It's just praising God, worshiping God, glorifying God. And I want you to notice what David says. This is truly why David is a man after God's own heart. He wrote an entire book. He wrote the majority of the book of Psalms just praising and glorifying God. You know what he was doing? He was fulfilling the one purpose, the, the main purpose in why God created all of man was to glorify himself. Look what it says in Psalm chapter 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Now watch the very, this is the last verse of the book of Psalms. Look at what it says. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You want to know the purpose of your life? You want to know why you were created? What's what is, what is the will of God for my life? I'll summarize it. You know, I will, simpl I will simplify it for you and summarize it in one word. What's the will of your life? You know, what, you know, what's the purpose of your life? God. That's why you're created. You're created to glorify God and to praise God. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Everything was created for him and for his good pleasure. Everything was created to glorify him. And you know when God entered into the creation as a man? You know what he did? He glorified himself in two ways. The Son of Man glorified God in heaven, and God glorified himself in the Son of Man. That's what happened. The glory which I had with thee before the world was, it's because he is that one and only true God. And you know what you should spend your entire life doing? Glorifying God. Worshiping and serving the one and only true God and glorifying the one and only true God. You know what? He's not going to, you know, he, the Bible talks about God being a jealous God. That he desires worship and he desires glory. And, and here's the thing I want to end on. Because he's worthy. Amen, amen. He's worthy of all of our praise and all of his honor. And you know what? Let me say this. The very last statement I'm going to make. Those four beasts, those four beasts are lucky that they get to stand before the throne of God for all eternity. Those 24 elders are lucky. It is a privilege that they get to sit right around the throne of God. And that God, it, they are privileged that God gave them a crown that they could for all eternity just cast at his feet. They're privileged. So you know what you should do? Spend your life glorifying God. Worshiping and serving and exalting him and lifting himself up. And we need to understand that God is a God that glorifies himself 
And there's nothing wrong with that because he's worthy of doing that. Amen. It's about right to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your greatness. We're so thankful that we have uh, a God of gods, a Lord of lords, that's worthy of honor and praise and worship. And help us just to glorify you in the way in which you deserve it. Help us to give you the honor that is due unto you. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to fear you. Help us to honor you as a father. Help us to honor you as a master and fear you as a father. We love you. Just be with us, dear Heavenly Father, and help us to grow in understanding. And uh, Lord, just be with our church and help us to grow that we might serve you in just a higher capacity. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.